I'm going to talk, as Kevin mentioned, about some work that I've um, been having a lot of fun doing at Intel uh, with colleagues, uh, engineering colleagues at Intel, and also with some, some external collaborators. And uh, it's a continuation of what um, Vic was talking about, of how, how do we encourage people to engage in healthy behaviors um, using today's platform. So using smartphones and using Facebook, those, that's where I'm going to concentrate today, even though in, in the projects that I do, we use a range of technologies. Um, and as a you know, clinical psychologist doing exploratory research at Intel, I, I view my mission in its most general uh, terms as helping people live the way they want to in the long term. So. How do we help people marry their long-term aspirations, or what I think uh, Vic was talking about as core values, with the moment-to-moment -moment choices that they make in daily life? Most people's long-term aspirations that I, that I talk to include uh, things about sustained relationships, physical and mental health, and also some security, whether that's physical safety or mater um, material or monetary security. Um, and then there are the decisions and choices we make in daily life regarding you know, how do we react to stress, uh, what do we eat, and how do, how do we exercise, and, and how do we spend money. And the, the reason that my job gets interesting is, of course, because there's this huge disconnect between these long-term choices and uh, the long-term aspirations and our moment-to-moment -moment choices. And this is described at length by uh, behavioral economists. And, and I'm not going to try to... Uh, synthesize all of that research here, but I'll talk about it a little bit um, in terms of marshmallows. And um, this, is, this picture is, is borrowed from The New Yorker. It's an article by Jonathan Lehrer summarizing uh, research that was started by a psychologist named Walter Mitchell in 1968. And um, what he was studying was delay of gratification. And this is the way we often think about this disconnect between the, our aspirations or moment-to-moment -moment choices. But the, these poor children were in, a, in an experimental room when many of them chose marshmallows as their candy of choice. And they were given the option, this study is now famous, so most of you have probably read about this in the last year in one format or another. But you know, given the option of you can have one marshmallow now, or if you wait 15 minutes, you can have two. And, um, and you know, most, most kids can't, didn't wait even 15 seconds. They, they either didn't ring the bell or they you know, just gobbled that along with other candy that was available to them. But 30% did, did wait. And, um, and those 30% not only got two marshmallows, but also uh, you know, reaped other rewards. They had better relationships in school. They, they, they performed more, uh, they were more successful academically. And, um, and actually, when he compared, like, uh, people who could only wait 30 seconds versus 15 minutes, um, there was a 210 point difference in SAT scores. So, so this ability to delay gratification or sort of control your mind and just pretend the marshmallow is a cloud or distract yourself is, very, is a very important skill to, to develop. And we can develop it as, you know, we can train adults or we can, you know, work with kids. This is, um, described in very compelling ways um, by um, Thaler in a book called Nudge, which was very, you know, very popular this last year, as the difference between our, our cold self that makes these decisions about how we want to act. We want to be healthy. We want to have these great long-term relationships. Um, we want to save money. And then the hot, impulsive decisions that we make in daily life. We want to have, two marsh we want to have one marshmallow now rather than waiting. Um, and it's also described and modeled extensively in terms of temporal discounting. And, um, and temporal discounting describes how at one moment, you know, I'd say at point A, we want, um, we, we may describe, set, set a goal, say this is January 1st of 2010. Set, set our um, goals on a, on a diet that's going to bring about health benefits. And we, we place a great deal of value on that. But a week or a day later, um, at dinner, we may face a piece of cake. And at that point, when we're making these choices that matter over time, because we make so many of them, the values cross. And we, we judge the cake to be much more valuable than we did a week ago, and the diet to be, and the diet and the health benefits to be far less valuable than we either judged them to be a week ago or that we will judge them to be the following night or the following, the following week. And so this 
this tension between you know, the diet, the health on one hand, and the cake on the other is, again, modeled in ways that are far beyond my, my skills by economists. Um, but they also come up in the work that I do. And I'm, um, in large part, you know, an, an ethnographer. So that means I do very qualitative research. I interview people um, in the context of their daily life and try to understand what does health mean to them, what do they want, and also what are their daily lives like? You know, who are they interacting with? What are the conflicts to getting what they want or to living the way they want to in the long term? So, but I think there are, there are different opportunities that we have now using today's technologies to revisit some of these techniques from psychology and really you know, make them more, more compelling and more persistent because our, our phones are with us all the time. We, we live in these environments of Facebook. So the, the techniques from clinical psychology, from social psychology, and behavioral economics we can revisit and hopefully deliver with more power and more, less stigma. So I'm going to go through just three examples of techniques from these fields. Obviously Obviously, there are many, many techniques that I'm not, this is just, um, these are illustrative of some of the projects that I've um, had the opportunity to work on. The first um, is borrowed from a technique of, um, well, techniques of you know, inviting emotional awareness and cognitive reappraisal. And these are primarily from cognitive behavioral therapy. And we're uh, you know, in Philadelphia, where this was really st started with um, Aaron Beck's institute, now, now run by Judith Beck at University of Pennsylvania. Martin Seligman is there as well with the Center of Positive Psychology. So there's a lot of uh, momentum here in Philadelphia in, in cognitive behavioral therapy. And um, as uh, you know, well, one of the ways in which I tried to uh, encourage emotional awareness was by um, a project of mobile therapy. I'll be talking about it later today in Jane's session. And um, in this application, the phone uh, tried to become the, we tried to test out the phone as the psychologist, checked in with you throughout the day about your moods, and asked in a pretty open-ended way for you to express uh, by moving a red dot around the screen what your emotional state was at that moment. And then um, people, there were many other states that people were reporting and um, other interventions, but what people could do periodically when they came in for interviews, and the other aspect of my research is that I, um, I do ethnography, and then when I make prototypes, we, you know, we give them to people and interview them repeatedly. We have them use them for a long period of time and interview them over time about how those are affecting their lives and what their responses to the technology is. So then periodically, people could come in and view trends of their mood. And this is a little, quite a bit more beautiful than what they, the graphs that they saw. But, but basically, could play around, um, grab the computer, and investigate mood as it related to other, other variables. So um, how does my mood vary uh, when I'm at work compared to when I'm at home? Uh, it looks like here, using this mood map as someone's viewing their trends, they're a little, um, a little bit more amped up at work and a little bit more negative at work than home. How about when I add in the factor of who I'm around, my social context? I can see here this person is like, if I look at the mood map ratings, you know, a little bit more negative around this combination of being around my boss and at work when I compare it to being at home with my son. And then what about if I want to see the factor, you know, what happens when I add food into the mix? So, Hmm, maybe this is why things aren't going so great at work. You know, it's like the, the caffeine sugar thing that works out well, you know, in the short term over, over time is kind of putting me up in this negative upper quadrant. And so this is, you know, part of why awareness of mindfulness of emotional states is important um, as a health behavior is that emotional reactions are a health behavior. We know that prolonged emotional reactivity, you know, prolonged stress reaction. If people don't bounce back, that's a risk factor for cardiovascular disease and other problems. But also, if you're trying to engage people in any kind of change, whether it's eating less sugar or exercising, we have to work with their, um, their emotional state at that time and their confidence and their ability to make change. So factoring in mood is really important in any, any health behavior. Another part of this, um, this application was um, cognitive reappraisal. And here, the sort of phone, depending on one's emotional state, would 
um, kind of borrow tech, this technique of cognitive reappraisal from cognitive therapy, where you just ask people to imagine a different way of thinking about things. Might I be, if I, if I ate the chocolate cake, is my interpretation it's the end of the world, forget it, I'm, I'm blowing that diet, or is it, you know, I'll get over this tomorrow's a new day, I'll eat differently. And uh, so it's kind of shorthand experience um, uh, inviting people to, to change. The, the second technique I wanted to talk about is from social psychology. Um, we, we know from social psychology that the way we develop is by watching other people. Social learning is how we uh, learn how to operate in the world, how we construct our identities, and um, we're profoundly affected by what we think other people are doing. And there's been a lot of work in the study of influence uh, led by Robert Cialdini at Arizona State University. There's a book called Influence. There's another book, a popular condensed version of that called Yes, that came out a couple years ago that summarized all these studies. And they're fascinating. Um, and the, the essence of it is that we, um, we, we do what we think everyone else is doing. And um, so this, a lot of health messaging can kind of Backfire. So if, um, if what we see are statements like more than 9 million kids are obese and the intent of that message is to fight obesity, it, it may have the opposite effect because kids who see this or parents who see this kind of feel like they're average and that's normal. Um, an alternative is to find a different behavioral norm that is accurate using advanced technologies to find, find the norms that, that make sense to people, provide them in a, in a momentary, in a meaningful, at a meaningful opportunity, present them on, on phones or whatever technologies people have at hand. And um, here, you know, again, tailoring, echoing um, uh, Vic's comments, you know, match, if we're talking to teens, you know, tailor it to, uh, to their age group, to their city, and um, pull them in the direction that you, that you want them to go. Um, okay, the, the third technique that I wanted to talk, talk about is, uh, or the third principle is really loss aversion. And the basic idea is that uh, losses loom a lot larger than gains. And, and often in health technology and in education, we think that we should we kind of overemphasize probably um, carrots and, and rewards. And um, in the book Nudge, Thaler, I think, you know, comes up with an estimate that where losses affect us about twice as much in a negative way as rewards or gains do in a positive way. So the pain of losing something is, is very acute for people. There have been um, some of the most um, clear studies about this have been done with coffee mugs, and um, so I'll try to I'll try to summarize one of these. Um, students, college students, um, a room of them, were given either um, a coffee mug or a big chocolate bar, and they were they cost about the same amount. And beforehand, they they gave their estimations of how much the coffee cup cost and how much the coffee um, how much the candy bar cost. And I think they were both around three bucks. And, um, but after they were assigned either a coffee mug or a chocolate bar, um, and it was only 10%, they were offered the opportunity to trade. You can, if you have a coffee mug, you can take a chocolate bar and vice versa. And only 10% of the people were willing to do this. So once we have something, and if that something is concrete and understandable and tangible, we don't want to let it go. And um, mainly loss aversion is kind of invoked as, a, as an explanation for how we screw up, how we make bad decisions about our health and how our money and our money and, and our real estate and all that. But, but we're starting to use it to, to um, understand the way that people operate and to help them kind of trick themselves into healthy behavior. One very cool website, um, and this is by um, Dean, Dean Carlin is one, is one of the founders um, called Stick, and this is one you may be familiar with, but you sort of um, set, a, set a health contract and gamble against, you know, sort of gamble that or bet on, bet on yourself. So um, if, you, if you don't meet your health goal, you have to give 
give a certain amount of money away. And in one, one scenario that's possible to choose, you, you set it up so that if you don't um, you know, follow through on your health goal, you have to give money to someone else's cause and a cause that you may not believe in, whether that's you know, the NRA or, or whatever, whatever the cause is that you don't like. But this is um, one that's been getting a lot of attention. Um, recently, I've uh, working with a couple couple colleagues, uh, Muki Hansen Uzora at Intel and Jane, uh, Joan Severson at Cognitive Media, have been playing around with this concept of of loss aversion um, in, using Facebook. And um, the question was, what's interesting to me is we, we know when what people care about the most, and the biggest motivator for health change is really relationships. You know, people, um, we we care about our friends, we we care about being liked, we care about our kids. Um, and you know that that's why people make change is is to to be close to other people and to have relation the opportunity to continue relationships. Um, so what if we we threatened um, or used the the fear of losing social capital as a sort of incentive structure? So what what happens in this application is um, I set a goal, and you can see my goal up here is. Um, you may or may not be able to see this. My current active goal is go outside even if it's raining. I live in Portland, and often it's raining, and very difficult to force myself to go outside. But a fresh air makes me, you know, does good things for my body and brain. So I try to do that. And every day I log in. And I'm supposed to log. I get an email. I'm supposed to log in and say, give a thumbs up or thumbs down. And you can see this is kind of an, an average week for me where I've, some of my friends are faded out. I've lost probably, it looks like, you know, probably 20 to 30% of my friends are, are grayed out. And um, I've still got a collection of friends that I can see. But I've, I've lost friends because I haven't been strictly adherent to my goal. And, um, and then as the week goes along, and I think this was last week, I, I didn't log in at all to this site. And you can see I've lost all of my friends, and um, and I can't even like with this one friend. You know, we, I've also I can't see her posting. Instead of her posting, this is Amimita, friend. You know, it says you know instead of seeing what she's up to, all it says is don't forget your resolution. So in order to see her postings or to get these friends back, I have to start walking again, and then then I can redeem them. So. Um, that's one, so we're kind of eager to see. It's called With a Little Help from My Friends. If any of you want to check, check that out, eager to see you know, what sort of um, reaction people have to this. But I think you know, more generally, there are just um, huge opportunities using Facebook and other social network applications to not only understand how health behaviors are spread among social networks, and a lot of this has been um, studied in very interesting ways and summarized in a book connected by um, Christakis and Fowler, which I strongly recommend if, if you haven't read it. Um, so not only to understand how, how behaviors spread, um, but also how we can intervene and make differences. Um, some of, we're starting to learn about, um, James Hill is doing some studies to try to understand if we're targeting obesity, who are the most influential people to target? It's not always people who are in the center of the network. Sometimes it's people on the edges. Um, and, and Facebook and these other applications are a great platform to test out different, um, I think, anyways, a great platform to test out different behavior change properties. And, and I think at the end of the day, what, the, what they offer is this opportunity to, to, to work with the social unit. And, and so we're affecting potentially you know, more people. And then um, for any one individual, if you change their environment and make the environment more you know, healthier, um, that's going to be more supportive of their sustained change. So that's where, that's where I'm going to drop off. Okay. <laughs>